Okay, everyone, uh, welcome back. We are continuing our discussion of the war and the Hobbit. So, to return to my little PPT. So, I was talking about how Thorin Oakenshield might represent a kind of qualification uh, of, or a kind of uh, subversion of a questioning of the same theory of bravery that Tolkien seems to espouse. While he upholds courage and chivalry in certain ways, it seems that an excess of this, it seems that an excess of this as embodied in, as epitomized by Thorin Oakenshield are condemned. Uh, because ultimately Thorin's actions are seen as sort of needlessly uh, uh, encouraging violence. Uh, admit. Okay, um, so that's the issue here. Um, Thorin's disrespect for rituals and codes of military conduct. Another thing that you'll see is that Thorin is not the most uh, chivalrous warrior. He is a kind of... Uh, violating or disrespecting certain codes of conduct, certain uh, correct codes of conduct. So, uh, for instance, the preliminaries to the Battle of the Five Armies and the Hobbit uh, are conducted in a series of ritual exchanges that define each side's position. Uh, but Thorin breaks this ritual sequence by shooting the herald. He, he shoots at the herald uh, and then battle becomes inevitable. And that is something you don't do. You don't shoot the herald. Okay, you remember, uh, in, you know, if you've seen a lot of fantasy movies, uh, you'll often have the situation where you have two armies camped and you have the herald who comes up and delivers a message from one king to the other. And it's supreme misconduct to harm the messenger. You, you're not meant to kill the messenger. But it's often the villains who will kill the messenger and send back the the horse with the body of the messenger and things like that. So in that sense, when Thorin attacks the messenger, he is violating the ideal military code of conduct. So Thorin's uh, Ofer mode represents a kind of overbold or hubristic chivalry, which Tolkien doesn't seem to be in support of. Now, we come to the last and most important bit of our discussion. What are the kind of thematic echoes between uh, the experience of the war for Tolkien and the Hobbit. So to begin with, you can see that the grand structure of the quest uh, underpins both uh, the Hobbit and war memoirs. So if you look at uh, writings by people who survived the First World War, they will often figure their own experiences as a kind of quest which they have survived. And this pattern underlies The Hobbit as well. So Henry Fussell, I think that's how you pronounce his name, F-U-S-S-E-L-L, -L, has a book called The Great War, in which he lists three stages of the quest, the journey, the struggle, and the exaltation of the hero. And, it's, and he comments that it's not impossible to be struck by the similarity between this conventional romance pattern and the standard experience reenacted and formalized in memoirs of the war. So if you read firsthand accounts of, of people when they describe their, their surviving the war, their rule in the war, it'll often have this quest structure, the journey, the struggle, and the exaltation of the hero. Uh, but the only complication is that this also underpins the romance, this also underpins various kinds of myths. So, Mother, uh, in your normal PG class, uh, the next lecture I will be doing with you uh, is actually I'll be returning to structuralism and I'll be going over no, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Vladimir Prop. Uh, um. Sorry, have I already done Prop with you guys? Uh, no, I've done Shlosky, I've done Shlosky. Defamiliarization. Defamiliarization. Uh, so morphology of the folktale. Yeah, morphology of the folktale. Morphology of the folktale. Prop says that there are these 33 functions, and he says that all of Russian folktales are basically can be broken down into these. Barthwaki. So, uh, so the structuralist, many structure. There are numerous critics who have done this. You have, for instance, Joseph Campbell. Uh, who in his uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, he says that numerous folk tales, numerous fairy tales, numerous epics and myths are underpinned by this basic structure of there and back again. 
in fact one of the topics that i could have investigated but i won't otherwise tomar the boddu kaj hoye jabe boddu material hoye jabe is how the hobbit is basically underpinned by the same structure of there and back is very obviously you go on a quest you engage with the dark forces and you come back transformed so this happens in the hobbit okay uh mm. so what i'm saying is that a quest pattern ta war memorial ache therefore you can say that in a sense the hobbit is also like a war memoir secondly and this is the most important point if you get a generalized question on war and the hobbit this is the point that you need to or you should focus on the most because this is the most significant aspect okay the depiction of space in the novel you see that there is a kind of polarity between pastoral and anti pastoral spaces do you know what pastoral is idyllic mm, yes sir yeah. the pastoral uh. is a kind of literary mode which goes all the way back to ancient greece and rome it is a literature yeah, of the, the countryside very... shepherds and swains uh. and uh, you know uh, typically kind of idyllic depictions of the countryside Uh, in which you have these poetic figures as well as shepherds engaging in various kinds of artistic activities and it's kind of basically very peaceful rural settings in which there is a harmony between man and nature because so that is a pastoral mm. mode so what you will see is that there are many we spaces have, we have a glimpse of that yeah go ahead we have a glimpse of that in that a uh, short rest the chapter a uh, short rest yes you have a glimpse of that in who is this i can't see you ah uh, can't is this shujaya yes you can't hmm. see me yes yes shujaya yeah i can see you. uh yeah that's a very valid point i'm just going to audio to jeri kore asche theek hai i can see you and hear you uh, that's a very valid point and yes we will come to that so what has been argued by uh, janet brennan croft and others is that um, there are there is an alternation between pastoral and and, and anti pastoral spaces in the novel okay so there is this idealized pastoral space which is the shire mainly it's the shire and the heroes in the novel keep returning to memories of the shire and that provides a kind of sustenance for them uh, when they are yeah i think or uh, not just the shire but i think rivendell also absolutely. is like a much more magnificent Ab pastoral place absolutely. absolutely but rivendell is not they don't describe it as much in this book as they do in the lord of the rings or uh -huh. they spend the long time in rivendell and it's really mm -hmm. its idyllic nature is kind of uh, very glorified yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. discussed in detail ekhane o the rivendell is state a be short hoy or i think to back the bishi narrative space is not occupied by but yeah it is one of many pastoral spaces in the novel so it i bapar bapar ta bol can i just interrupt for one yeah, second please go ahead bolchi je shobai please ektu mic ta off korbi jokhon sir kotha bolche mane onek unwanted awaj asche thank you korte parish chale you can mute yourself that does uh, in, reduce the noise and if you want, have a question you can unmute yourself that's up to you thik ache to shirai bolchi now there are uh, both in the lord of the rings and in the hobbit there are certain war ravaged spaces which you might call anti pastoral spaces and in between you have spells uh, in which the uh, uh, in which the uh, the heroes just hold on i need to just uh close this one second uh yeah so uh kind of slide uh so that's what i'm talking about the pastoral uh becomes a space to imaginatively protect oneself from the experience of the war uh quite humorously janet brennan croft says that like rum uh, a deep dugout or a woolen vest uh, the pastoral becomes something that the soldier or in this case the heroes of the novel use to protect oneself from the psychological scars of the war experience so in this novel it's particularly the shire uh but also rivendell also beyond's home i think beyond's home even much more than rivendell because beyond's home to onik this detail is described correct 
or there are those animals the animals come and serve them food and all that if you had a look at the handout i gave you that is one of the most ridiculous passages in the, in the novel i found in which the talking animals come and give you food and all that it kind of breaks the uh, the otherwise sort of not completely unrealistic style of of writing anyway so uh, would you agree beyond's home you remember the description of beyond's home and particularly because it contrasts with what they have just gone through they have experienced the goblin tunnels they come out of that and then they go and they get refuge in beyond home so this contrast between pastoral and anti pastoral spaces so recourse to the pastoral is an english mode of both fully gauging the calamities of the great war and imaginatively protecting oneself against them hmm. so this is something that again fossil writes henry fossil writes in his great war uh, the, the book called the great war and modern technology and he says that in the literature of the first world war you do have some instances of authors recalling pastoral spaces and this recourse to the pastoral space is a way of gauging the calamities of the great war because ki hai you see environmental destruction if you look at what the war does to the european landscape 1917 to dekh bhi it completely ravages the fields you know the torn fields of france is what uh, i think i think who is it uh this is the torn fields of france it's it's oh, this is so exciting now uh i'm going to just minimize this uh leave this open the internet uh flanders fields in flanders fields um and then there's the torn fields of france uh uh break of the day in the trenches i just want to read you some of this stuff because you have to understand the broader picture in flanders fields this is a short poem uh it's taking a long time to load because uh, the internet on this app draws quite heavily on the internet okay let me just read this poem it's so so moving it's called break of day in the trenches and this is by uh, ye yeah, isaac rosenberg the darkness crumbles away it is the same old druid time as ever only a live thing leaps my hand a queer sardonic rat as i pull the parapet's poppy to stick behind my ear drawl rat they would shoot you if you if they knew your cosmopolitan sympathies now you have touched this english hand you will do the same to a german soon no doubt if it be your pleasure to cross the sleeping green between it seems you inwardly grin as you pass strong eyes fine limbs haughty athletes less chance than you for life bonds to the whims of murder sprawled in the bowels of the earth the torn fields of france what do you see in our eyes at the shrieking iron and flame hurled through still heavens what quaver what heart aghast poppies whose roots are in man's veins drop and are ever dropping but mine in my ear is safe just a little white with the dust this is uh, rosenberg is incredibly moving i find it so difficult to teach war poetry without sort of uh, you know, just crying it's such incredibly moving language again this is a poem by john mccrae called in flanders fields In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. He's talking about the graves of the people who died. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. to you from failing hands we throw the torch be yours to hold it high if we break faith with us who die we shall not sleep the poppies grow in flanders field um so just you know incredibly moving stuff um but we are talking then about the kind of environmental degradation that uh, 
the war caused and the pastoral um, so memories of the of the home of the english countryside become a kind of woolen vest almost that the soldiers wear and that is exactly what happens throughout the hobbit and the lord of the rings you remember bilbo keeps on complaining i wish i was back home i wish i was back home i wish i wish i could see the shire i wish i could see the fields i wish i could see you know so this mm. pastoral space becomes a kind of escape for him and to contrast with that you have the anti pastoral spaces so the desolate spaces murkwood you know the gloom and the darkness of murkwood the desolation of smog which is the entire area that smog has destroyed mm. in, uh, near the mountain um the cave the cave yes the goblin the tunnels yes 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 okay so uh, the shire then shares with the traditional pastoral an emphasis on the simplicity of life and freedom from the ambiguities and complications of advanced civilization uh, and in keeping with tolkien's abhorrence for the age of machines the shire is still a place where the simplest of machines nothing more complicated than a forge bellows or a water mill or a hand loom are used and in contrast to this you have the mechanized spaces you have some references to the goblins having machines and in the lord of the rings this is further developed this entire issue is further developed but basically the shire has a kind of contrast with the anti pastoral spaces in murkwood for instance sauron does not just destroy nature but uses and perverts it when he dwelt in murkwood the forest was an unwholesome place inhabited by spiders and that's what the, also the war does with the, the fields of france these beautiful fields are destroyed and perverted and turned into these trenches so what sauron does to murkwood is a kind of parallel for what the war does to the fields of france all right and so the pastoral becomes important and now let's compare uh, what is the purpose of the pastoral the purpose is to remind the struggling soldier of the home okay so we can contrast the shire to for instance rupert brooks evocation of a pastoral england in his poem the soldier uh, in the soldier he says if i should die think only this of me that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever england there shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed a dust whom england bore shaped made aware gave once her flowers to love her ways to roam a body of england's breathing english air washed by the rivers blessed by sons of home and think this heart all evil shed away a pulse in the eternal mind no less gives somewhere back the thoughts by england given her sights and sounds dreams happy as her day and laughter learned of friends and gentleness in heart at peace under an english heaven so that is very much in in line with descriptions of a home that um that frodo and bilbo keep evoking you know the the, the rivers and the fields of the shire the clean air the blessed sun of home okay so the pastoral oasis in the hobbit is uh you know it it's and what it's there but but it's it's somewhat different from how it's evoked in the lord of the rings so the point i just brought up now on the screen the pastoral oasis in the lord of the rings often occurs close to or within the violence so for instance you will see that uh it has, you know you don't have to discuss lotr much because it's not the main text but uh there is a part of the lotr where uh, there is a place called orthank which is where saruman an evil wizard has taken up refuge it's his sort of uh stronghold and the heroes storm uh, or thank and overthrow it and there's a battle there and in the middle of the battle two of the hobbits in the novel uh, merry and pippin discover some tobacco and they sit and they smoke a pipe and it's a kind of peaceful interlude that happens right in the middle of a war ravaged space So Janet Brennan Cross sees this as typical of the Lord of the Rings in general it is perhaps closer to the actual experience of a soldier because they are in the battlefields and they are remembering home so there is an imbrication of the two there is an interlaying or interweaving of the two spaces 
there is a co-temporaneity of the two. That is, you're experiencing them at the same time. You're remembering the home while being physically in the battlefield. So the Lord of the Rings is closer to that. By contrast, uh, by contrast, in The Hobbit, the pastoral interludes occur more gradually. There are spaces in between. So the pastoral oasis in The Hobbit is less clearly defined by contrast with its surroundings. Because except for the final battle, the action of the book does not take place in a landscape dominated by war. So one thing to note about The Hobbit, for instance, is that a contrast of also Tao's strong noir because the only completely ravaged spaces are the desolation of smog. So for one thing, the novel is not completely dominated by these anti-pastoral spaces. So this pastoral, anti-pastoral contrast is not as strong as what you get in The Lord of the Rings. And also the pastoral moment does not usually occur immediately after a moment of great stress. There are gaps. So after the party es escapes the trolls, there is a long march before they reach Rivendell. Between the battle with the wogs and goblins and the stay in Beyond's house, the party spends the night with the eagles. So there's a kind of gradual transition. There are So this is a kind of thing that you may note. Acta battle holo, then there's a passage, then there's a pastoral space. But the Lord of the Rings is much more kind of the two are imbri imbricated or interlaid. Hmm. What the implications of this, I leave it to you to analyze. I haven't actually been able to draw it out the implications of it. In fact, The Hobbit was written much closer to Tolkien's actually having fought the war. So if anything, he should have been thinking of these two uh, as sort of interlaid much more than sort of separated. But perhaps it's the nature of... Uh, you know, this is a children's story uh, in which you need to perhaps give some sense of relief to the children. So perhaps that's one explanation. Okay, and we'll move into our final slide now. I'm nearly done for the day. Okay, so those are the major issues, the pastoral and anti-pastoral and the issue of heroism. Now the minor echoes, the kind of minor points of similarity. I've listed out quite a few. In fact, just to annoy Ritu Doshi, I was thinking of giving nine points. But I, I have, in fact, written ten points. Consider me annoyed. Uh -huh. so, uh, so, basically, I mean, you don't have to reproduce it. I've said you can have your freedom to add, subtract, whatever. Uh, make your own points. Add your own critical inputs. But I am going to give you some certain sort of points of similarity between the novel and uh, the experience of war, the idea of fellowships and groups and parties. This is very obvious. Uh, you know, there is a kind of sense of camaraderie that forms between troops during war. You fight in battalions and you come to know your uh, immediate fellow soldiers very well. The dynamics of these groups are in some ways similar to the dynamics of fellowships that you see in both The Hobbit and in Lord of the Rings. Uh, Hobbit, it's a fellowship of The Hobbit, Bilbo with the 13 dwarves. Uh, and in The Lord of the Rings, there is a much more diverse group. Number two, a minor incident, but uh, you remember Bomber, the fact of he falls into uh, the river in, in the Mirkwood. Mirkwood, there's this river and they, they are meant to cross it very carefully because if you fall into it, it's a kind of... Uh, it reminds one of uh, what is that? Uh, uh, the, my heart aches and drowsy numbness means I just as though a hemlock had drowned. Uh, let's see, was let's see, what said some let's see the river, let's see the river of sleep. I'm quoting from Ode to a Nightingale. Uh, yeah, so the river of for forgetfulness and sleep in, in classical mythology. So there is a river in Mirkwood and Bomber falls into that and he becomes for a while kind of like kind of like a dead body and they have to drag him around, remember? So that is perhaps similar to the experience of death in the trenches and the dragging of bodies. Minor point I already mentioned earlier, Bilbo leaving the Shire without any provisions reminds one of Tolkien's own experience of having lost his provisions. Uh, the overwhelming presence of refugees in the novel, um, and this is something worth unpacking. Another aspect of World War I that may be reflected in Tolkien's fiction is the plight of refugees and displaced populations. Discussing the crowds of townspeople forced out of uh, Lake Town uh, by the death of smog in The Hobbit, the scholar Alex Lewis 
uh, reminds us in an essay written, uh, okay, 10 minutes, I'll try to wrap up. Uh, just got the 10 minute warning. But he says that Tolkien must have seen firsthand totally displaced refugee populations. He'd, he'd have seen because the war caused a lot of refugeeism, uh, crisis of refugees. And this you see, of course, in the uh, people who, are, you know, both, of course, the dwarves who are refugees because they are driven out of their mountain home, but also the people of Lake Town, uh, their home is also destroyed by, uh, by smog. Uh, in the case of the dwarves, of course, also it parallels with the Jewish history. Next point, civic claustrophobia and call to arms. Eta, basically, the idea is that uh, until uh, Gandalf comes and sets Bilbo on his quest, there is a sense that he develops, particularly if you look at the description of the tunnels, as a kind of safe but kind of ensconing space, as a kind of space where you will not mature, you will not develop. There's a kind of sense of civic claustrophobia. There's a sense of being constrained by domesticated by certain spaces, not being allowed to mature and grow up. Bilbo seems to be kind of subconsciously resisting this. There's a Tukish side in his nature, which is wanting to experience a call to arms, wanting to experience adventure and battle. Okay, so uh, The Hobbit written in 1937 introduces the Shire and the Hobbits. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm quoting from Janet uh, Brennan Clark, but basically Bilbo sets off on his journey Influenced by his Turkish adventurousness and despite his occasional wish to be back in his nice hobbit hole, uh, you know, and so here, here Tolkien might have been in, unconsciously influenced by uh, the monotony of civic claustrophobia. So many in, individuals who did not join up in the war effort would have actually felt constrained or confined and would have perhaps regretted this. And so there's a sense of that. In fact, Rupert Brooke has a poem called Peace in which he says, now God be thanked whom ha who has matched us with his hour and caught our youth and wakened us from sleeping. So a sense of being, uh, you know, arise awake uh, and, and join this war effort. So that parallels Bilbo's sort of leaving his home. Number six, a uh, sense of British understatement and reserve. I've already discussed this. Stiff upper lip attitude, resolve to conceal emotions. Um, in fact, one important quote here is that during the Battle of the Five Armies, Bilbo describes the experience as, and I quote, very uncomfortable, not to say distressing, which is a kind of comical uh, understatement, all right? It's a kind of very British uh, tongue-in-cheek, it's a kind of humorous understatement that he does. So. These comic exchanges are reminders of the kind of celebrated phlegmatic British restraint in the trenches. So British soldiers were famous during the war for their stoicism, for their sort of, you know, uh, wittily or sort of uh, sarcastically sort of uh, laughing off the, the horrors of the experience and saying, all right, you know, keep calm and keep fighting on. The stoic resistance, all right? Um, in fact, uh, young officers were known to call the trenches darned unpleasant. Uh, darned unpleasant being, you know, the obvious kind of understatement of the horrors of being in the trenches, all right? A couple of more minor points, thinking of threes. Now, this is a rather strange thing. You see, the soldiers who fought in the trenches were habituated to living their lives in a cycle of threes. This means that there were three trenches. There were three kinds of trenches. There was a frontline trench, there was a support trench, and there's a rest trench. Okay. So they would spend a, and, and they used to rotate. So they used to take turns. First, you spend a period on the front line, then you go to the support trenches, and then you go to the rest. Okay, you take rest for a few weeks. So Ibabe, their entire lives were governed by a cycle of threes. And this apparently had very deep psychological effects for many. Years they kept on living in the cycle of threes and soldiers became kind of indoctrinated into thinking in threes. And one thing you'll notice in The Hobbit is that the number three uh, is quite significant. Okay, okay, it occurs quite often in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Gandalf speaks of, speak to the trolls three times. The dwarves make three attempts to join the feasting woodland elves. In The Lord of the Rings, uh, three of the hobbits Okay, so many things happen. So a lot of things are examples were shared, but there is so there are some instances of thinking in threes in uh, Hobbit as well. As I mentioned, you can think of some more examples if you can find them. 
uh, okay, um, and also the general tendency of going not you know from action to action, but moving through a kind of interlude of rest. As you've noticed, they'll go the heroes face some battle, and then there's a period of rest, whether it's in Beyond's home or in Rivendell. So this is also similar to the kind of movement from the trench to interludes in the support trenches and in the rest trenches. Okay, and just wrapping up. Number nine, literature on the battlefront. One thing, uh, again, mysterious dots are appearing. But one thing that I've already mentioned is that you had for the first time a highly literate army, well supplied by an efficient postal service. Soldiers of World War I were reading a lot in the trenches. And this you see reflected in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings okay, in the songs. Um, there are a lot of songs and myths and stories that are recounted by the heroes. While they're in the middle of their quest, they are constantly telling tales and this is a reflection of the way in which people like Tolkien uh, were thinking uh, about, uh, were reading literature and reflecting uh, as well. Okay, uh, Literature was consolation and reassurance. Many soldiers drew great comfort from comparing themselves to Christian, the character Christian in Pilgrim's Progress. And in the same way, many characters in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings through a thorough grounding in the songs and legends of Middle Earth, can draw consolation from past events with which they feel connected. Okay, and finally, last point no one returns from war unchanged, and the same is true for Bilbo. Uh, though we see this only in the uh, Lord of the Rings, we don't really see the scars so much in this particular story, but he has been changed and he has been transformed by it. Uh, in fact, so much so that he has to leave the world. He, as well as Frodo, um, Eventually, in the Lord of the Rings, they depart from the Grey Havens and leave the world. Uh, the hero who accomplishes the journey and the struggle is marked by a change that sets him apart from the community to which he returns. And here I appreciate Rita Doshi's uh, comparison to, uh, to Gollum. Okay? Uh, Siegfried Sassoon once wrote that the man who had really endured the war at its worst was everlastingly differentiated from everyone except his fellow soldiers. Okay? They felt shell shock, they felt great difficulty in being reintegrated in much the same way as Bilbo and Frodo. All right, that brings us to our the end of our discussion of war in The Hobbit and also to some extent in The Lord of the Rings. If you have any questions, you can ask me. There's two minutes left before this meeting ends. Uh, so, so, uh, hello. Yeah, go on. Uh, so, uh, does uh, Tolkien comment on the humanity in general in this paragraph in the this chapter over hill and under hill uh, you see there's uh, when the goblins attack the dwarves there's this uh, hammers axes swords daggers pickaxes tongs and also instruments of torture they make very well or get other people to make to their design yeah yeah, yeah. Very, much, very much much i think it's a reflection that, on on armaments on on weaponry and, uh, and it is not unlikely that they invented some of the machines that have since troubled the world, especially yeah. the ingenious devices for killing large numbers of people at once. Fantastic, Shujaya. That ingenious. is really good. I'm, see, Shujaya, I'm a very them. close reader. I really appreciate this quality that you have. This is a very good example. Can you please repeat that last line? Instruments of what? Repeat that. Oh. It is not likely that they invented some of the machines that have since troubled the world, especially the ingenious devices for killing large number, numbers Perfect. of people at once. Perfect. You quote yes. that line. Large and number of people. Engines and explosions always do. And this is them. unique. You know, this is unique to the first world. Because here we see for the first time, when I teach war poetry, I talk about this. Mass technological warfare. Technologies that destroy human life at a scale never before experienced. So that is a very direct reference to the war. Thank you very much. Now, less than one minute left. Any last questions? This is going to meeting is going to end suddenly by itself. All right. I'll get to your Bible ready for our club. Any any issues? Any questions? Tigaji, any further issues? We can discuss it in the WhatsApp chat. All right. So see you everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Take care of yourself. Stay safe. Okay. Bye. Bye, sir.